All right, well, why don't you uh, tell us your name, a little bit about yourself and your family. My name is Samara Howlett. I'm 16 years old. I have two older sisters, an older brother, and a brother-in-law. Okay, now where are you from and how long have you been at Sea Rope? I was originally, I was born in Florida, then moved to St. John, then we moved here, and we have been here, I've been going to Sea Rope for 11 years. Okay, awesome. Samara, give us a word to describe who you are. A word that I probably use to describe myself would be determined. And why would you choose that word? Um, well, I'm very indecisive and um, it's usually pretty hard for me to make up my mind, but when I do, it's usually people can't really change my mind. But, um, so I think it could be a good thing and probably a bad thing sometimes, but <laughs> that's probably what, uh, why I use the word determined. All right, thanks, Mara. Now, I know you in the context of playing some nine square with <laughs> yes. you. You have been very competitive. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so I look forward to a rematch. Yes. All right. For sure. Thanks, Mara. We can give her a hand, right? Let's give her a hand. <laughs> At this time, we're going to be dismissing kids to nursery ages birth to two. And uh, if you're age three to grade three, we have an awesome socially distanced um, activity for you out on the boulevard. So you can just head out through those doors, take a right. I'm uh, so glad to be here with you and to share with you today. This is actually my first sermon in over three months because I've been on paternity leave for the past three months with my son Henry and my daughter June. And uh, it was an incredible time. It was so special. Um, I'm grateful to live in a country that allows me to do that. I have tons of diaper stories I could share with you. I think I'll hold those off till, till next sermon. But instead, I want to take you back nine years to June 2nd, 2012. And June 2nd, 2012 was the best day of my life. It was the day that I married my wife, Hannah. We got married in Barker, New York at Lighthouse Christian Camp. And uh, it was just, it was, it was the perfect day. It was everything we could imagine and then some. But it almost didn't happen that way. A few weeks leading up to the wedding, I was at Hannah's house, and we were uh, preparing for the wedding, going over some details, and her parents have an above-ground pool that's it's probably about four and a half feet above the ground, and as, as we took a break to go swimming, I thought, this is a great opportunity to really impress my wife. I'm, I'm going to impress her with my athletic ability and ability to jump. It sounds ridiculous. Uh, but I, I had it set in my mind, so I'm like, Hannah, watch this. I bet I can jump over that wall without touching it. I know, you guys are really impressed right now. So I, I got a running start, jumped as high as I could. I felt like I was like free willy going over that, like eight feet in the air. Really, I barely made it over the wall. And as I landed, I heard a pop in my stomach. And uh, I came up out of the water. It just felt really uncomfortable and kind of sore. wasn't sure what it was. And as the days went on, I got more sore and more uncomfortable and eventually I went to the doctor's office and they were like yeah you gave yourself a hernia jumping so hard <laughs> just weeks before your wedding and they're like we have to get this fixed now it can't wait and and I was all for fixing it but my big question was like am I going to be able to participate fully in my wedding like it, it, am I going to be able to get married and will I be able to to participate and the doctor's like yeah of course um just make sure you don't do a lot of dancing standing for long periods of time or lifting anything heavy i'm like great so i can't help with the prep for the wedding because i can't lift stuff and you're telling me i basically have to be seated for my entire wedding I had no choice i went through the surgery uh even the days leading up to the wedding i could barely stand up straight and the day i woke up the day of the wedding i had a choice to make Either I could fully participate in the wedding, despite the fact that my circumstances were less than ideal and less than I, I had hoped for, or I could sit by in a chair and watch idly while all my family and my, my friends celebrated my big day. And y'all, I danced like nobody was watching. I'm not a dancer, but I was good that day. I, I, I stood as much as I needed to. I had so much fun. Uh, it was everything I could imagine and more. I chose to participate. And I share that with you because I think some of us here today 
have found ourselves in a similar season of life to that. Like, like maybe for you, we're, we're coming up on a year since COVID lockdowns. Maybe for you, in the beginning of 2020, you had all these plans like me and goals you were going to set in place for your physical health and your mental health and your spiritual health and goals in your job and places you were going to travel and people you were going to see. And then COVID happened. And everything on your to-do list got moved to your do-not list. We really experienced that here in, in church life. You know, we had all these plans for rolling out some new equipment on the stage. We were excited about all of our small groups that were meeting throughout the week here in the building and in Brockville and surrounding areas. In, in fact, we, we bought a play structure to use as a missional outreach to our community. And then COVID happened. And so much of what was on the to-do list moved to the do-not list. Circumstances were way less than ideal. And I found that through this season, I've been asking the question, what does it mean to participate in church when everything has changed? When the world as we know it has changed, what does it mean to participate in the kingdom of God when circumstances are less than ideal? And as I've asked that question, I found that our sermon series on short stories has been really helpful because throughout the series, Jesus has been telling us stories in the form of a parable of what it actually means to participate in the kingdom of God. And keep in mind, this is before there were big church buildings. This is before the latest small group Bible study. This is before Christianity is, is even called Christianity. And so I want to look at Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, Jesus shares a story that illustrates what it means to participate in the kingdom of heaven. Since Jesus also told them other parables, he said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited. Now, I just want to contextualize this real quick because in that day and age, if you were invited to the king's son's wedding, that's a party you're not going to miss. This is the king. I mean, imagine the power he holds over the land you own and taxes and your jobs and your, your family. Like, there's an obligation to attend this wedding. And at the same time, this is the king. Can you imagine what type of parties this guy can throw with the amount of money he has? The, the favors that he would send the guests home with? The entertainment? The food? So it seems crazy that anyone would turn this down. But it says this, they all refused to come. Not some of them. Not just a few. Everybody that received the invite refused to come and it's crazy what the king does next because if I'm the king and I've invited you to the greatest party of the century and you say no that's okay more food for me I'm not going to invite you again but this is this is what the king does so he sent other servants to tell them the feast has been prepared the bulls and fat and calf have been killed and everything is ready come to the banquet but the guests he had invited ignored them and went on their own way one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. Sounds a little harsh. You get invited to a party twice and you insult and kill someone. I feel like a, a polite no would suffice. But we have to keep in mind who Jesus is speaking to during this time. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. And historically for the nation of Israel... They had had servants sent to them, sent to them, prophets of God, inviting them to participate in what God was doing. And time and time again, they rejected, they insulted, and oftentimes they killed those prophets. In fact, just a short time after Jesus shares this, he's going to be rejected, insulted, and killed on a cross. So the king, who represents God in this story, was furious, and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. 
But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. And then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now we don't know what this man actually wore to this party. We don't know if he came in pajamas or maybe he was wearing all black like a funeral. Whatever he wore that day communicated this much to the king and the people who attended. That this man didn't come ready to participate in the wedding banquet. There's a a dress code for weddings that you're expected to abide by. And what Jesus is doing in this illustration, and maybe you're like, you hear this and you're like, yeah, it seems kind of harsh that that he just throws him out for what he's wearing. But just imagine if I was your best man for your wedding. And we had had communication over months preparing for this big day. And uh, we had picked out the ties and the vests and the shoes and everything. We, were all, we had all the groomsmen matching. And then on your wedding day, you began to walk down the aisle and you see your family and friends all dressed in their best, so excited to be there. You see the bridesmaids all matching, the groomsmen all with their matching ties. And then you see me with my COVID mullet and my white tank top and shorts and fluffy purple slippers. Oddly specific, I know. <laughs> I imagine that you would be a little disappointed that it would seem like I hadn't really taken this seriously and shown up to participate. There's a dress code for weddings. And much in the same way as there's a dress code for weddings, Jesus is using this as an illustration to say that there is a dress code for the kingdom of heaven. Now, this dress code isn't a physical dress code. If you show up next week and you're wearing a white tank top and shorts and fluffy purple slippers, you are more than welcome to come in. We're not going to turn you away. In fact, there's probably some people watching online right now that are wearing something very close to that because they just got to roll out of bed and watch the service. There's a spiritual dress code for the kingdom of heaven. This is how the Apostle Paul describes it. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. And then in verse 12, he says this, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. There's a spiritual dress code for the kingdom of heaven if we want to participate in it. It's no longer enough just to show up. That dress code, as Paul describes it, is holiness. And I know when some of us hear that, that does something internally because in our modern day context, holiness has a a negative connotation at times. You know, maybe you've met someone who is, uh, holds themselves morally superior to you, or holier than thou, or they, they have these rigid rule sets that they expect you to abide by. In fact, it's, it's one of the things that Christians can get a bad rap for in today's day and age. But our definition of holiness and God's definition of holiness is completely different. See, when God uses the term holiness, he means to be set apart. This is how Tim Keller says it. A holy person is someone who looks at God and does not say, just give me the rules and tell me what the rules are so I can get in. No, a holy person is someone who says, I belong to you. I'm set apart for you. Holiness is an attitude of the heart in which you look at God and say, use me. Holiness is an attitude of the heart. And that flies in the face of what a lot of us have been led to believe because in our modern context, what you do determines who you are. The the world tells us that your significance and your value comes from the job you work or the amount of money you bring or that retirement or how well your kids are achieving or your grandkids are succeeding. 
And while the world says what you do makes you who you are, the gospel of Jesus says what he did makes you who you are. So I'm not living for acceptance. I'm living out of the acceptance that Jesus Christ has already given me. Living a holy life is just responding in gratitude to what he's already done in my life. Some of us were tempted to show up to church and say, okay, what do I need to be holy? How much do I have to pray during the week? How many songs do I need to sing in worship? How how many times do I need to listen to sermons online to achieve holiness? But holiness is not something you achieve. It's not something you succeed at. It's an attitude of the heart. John Wesley said it like this. There's no external profession, no ceremonial ordinances or privileges of birth that could entitle any blessings of the Messiah's kingdom. Only an entire heart change, as well as a change of life, is necessary for that purpose. Holiness is an attitude of the heart. When Hannah and I went to university, we... uh, we attended uh, Houghton College, and there was a pond down by the soccer field. It was called Shen Pond, and it was the most disgusting pond you've ever seen. I mean, just green with algae, and it smelled weird, and there was trash in it. Once a year, my roommates and I would jump into this pond just to be dumb college kids, and uh, one time we jumped in, and we found a couch. Not sure how that got there. Uh, We found a mattress, we found cans and bottles, and, and we'd hear these stories about people who would find fish with tumors on them because of how dirty the water was. The thing is, though, that, that water didn't always used to be that stagnant, smelly water. See, there used to be this stream of fresh water that would run down the hill and pour into that body of water. And as it did, before there was any trash in it, it would purify that water and it would keep it clean. And it would feed the ecosystem around it. But at some point, enough trash accumulated in that pond that it cut off the supply of life and fresh water. And that pond grew stagnant and slowly died. There are some of us here today who feel a lot like that stagnant pond in this COVID season. You've been cut off from the normal way of of doing life, church services, friends and family, people who can encourage you and, and pour into you. And in fact, in many cases, this has led to people unintentionally cutting off God from their life or even sometimes intentionally doing that. And as you've walked through the season, you've found that there's trash floating to the surface that you didn't even know existed. Marital strain substance abuse, a thought life that is anything but healthy, anxiety, depression. And it's like, man, on my best days, I I try to show up to church, but it's all that I can do to show up, let alone participate. If that's you today and you've been living in isolation, I have good news for you. The king keeps inviting and inviting and inviting. There is no situation, no place in life, no person here in this building or watching online that is too hopeless for the kingdom of God. The king keeps inviting and inviting and inviting. So what does it mean for us to really clothe ourselves in holiness? How do we begin this process in a season where everything has changed, where everything looks different? I think, number one, we have to step out of isolation from God. Some of us, this season has has been a season of isolation from that thing, the very thing, the very person who really gives us true life, who is like a never-ending well of life. Maybe you've made decisions that have led to that. Maybe it's been unconscious and just as you've stepped away from church, it's, it's kind of just happened over time. If we want to cultivate hearts of holiness, We have to step out of isolation from God. What that means this week is daily carving out time to be with Jesus. Maybe that means going for a walk and and just letting God speak to you daily. 
Maybe it means just being away from your cell phone for a time so that you can really plug into what God is saying to you. Maybe, maybe it means going on a walk and leaving your cell phone behind so that you can have that time with Jesus. We have to step out of isolation from God. And the second thing is we need to step out of isolation from community. You know, when we tried to pull that mattress out of the pond, it had been sitting there for who knows how long. And the mattress, it was all waterlogged. And so what normally would have been a one-person job took a crew to lift out, like four or five guys to drag it out onto the shore. You know, if you want to remove that trash in your life, if you want to cultivate a heart of holiness, you cannot do it alone, especially in this season. I may be a little biased because our small group's pastor is my wife, but I think she's done an incredible job setting us up, not only so that we can meet in person when, when uh, restrictions are lifted, but also so that we can meet in our small group communities online. There are tons of small group communities online happening right now where you can get plugged in, where you can get reconnected with community. And I just want to challenge you this week. If you've been cut off, if you've been isolated from community, there's no better time to start than right now. Get plugged into Zoom, get plugged into those meetings, and get plugged into community. You know, one day, that pond will hopefully be cleaned up. All the trash will be taken out. The stream that runs down the hill, hopefully that will be reconnected and begin to purify that water. And what's amazing is that as it does that, it's not only going to become a pure water source, it's going to be something that provides life to the surrounding ecosystem. When we begin to cultivate hearts of holiness, when we allow God to pour into us, when we step into community and allow each other to to help each other, pull that trash out of our lives, we become like that purified water, giving life to the community around us. Can you imagine what would happen in our lives if everybody here, everybody watching online began to step out of isolation from God and community and allowed our hearts to be purified? How would that begin to feed and and nourish spiritually those around us, our neighbors, our family, our friends? How would that overflow into our schools and our city? What could be changed just by the simple act of cultivating holiness in our hearts? May we be a people here today and watching online who, despite the circumstances around us, strive with all we have to cultivate hearts of holiness by connecting with God and community. God, we thank you for who you are. I thank you for every person watching online right now, every person in this building. I thank you for this community we live in. And God, I pray that in this difficult season that you would draw us together, that you would draw us closer to you, that you would begin just to fill our lives and purify our hearts, remove that trash that we have held on to for far too long. God, make us more like you in everything that we say and everything that we do. And as we do that, God, would you just pour us out into this community? May this just be the stirrings of revival as we seek to cultivate hearts of holiness in our own lives. We pray this in your name. Amen.